Welcome back. So this next part is a brief introduction to what neuroeconomics is. Um, what is neuroeconomics? Neuroeconomics basically combines methods from, from three core disciplines, and they include psychology, behavioral economics, and cognitive neuroscience. And I'm trying to illustrate this, or actually not me, but um, Paul Glimscher. This is a figure from Paul Glimscher's book on neuroeconomics. These three disciplines actually over, overlap in terms of the topics they are researching. So economics is looking at how individuals make decisions and it has concepts like utility. Psychology also looks at this, but utility there is called decision value. And in neuroscience, we look at neural activation during a certain task that is related to what economists and psychologists do. So these three fields overlap. We'll go into a little bit more detail later on actually leading to quite a natural uh, combination of, of uh, research approaches in the field of neuroeconomics for, for these three fields. Now, while we have these three traditional disciplines that include psychology, behavioral economics, and cognitive neuroscience, more recently this has also been expanded, obviously, to include uh, well questions concerning the role of emotions in economic decisions, and this would be covered typically by, or traditionally by, effective neuroscience. Social neuroscience has, has joined the efforts with many social neuroscientists also using economic games and also being interested in, in the neural correlates of this. And then we have psychiatry, which again is a natural discipline to join because many psychiatric disorders are actually uh, defined in terms of their impact on real life decisions. And this is a common uh, question in, in assessments um, well, it's basically phrased as, well, how, to what extent does your, um, well, not disease, but do your symptoms affect uh, your, your daily life and your daily decisions? So this is part of many important questionnaires, the, the extent to which this affects social and economic decisions. And also marketing, obviously everyone has heard of neuromarketing, has also joined the discipline recently. So um, neuroeconomics is, is made up of three core disciplines, psychology, behavioral economics or economics in general, and cognitive neuroscience. But more recently, there have been influences from and it has influenced uh, different disciplines. And this list is obviously expanding. And here's a way to to uh, illustrate these different levels of explanations that are commonly used across different disciplines. So at the very core level, we have we can look at our genes and look at how they how these influence our behavior. And this is this is commonly done nowadays, um, where geneticists look at how the gene genome is associated with specific behaviors, also in economics. Now. Our genes are what makes up our cells and the genetics encoded within the cells also affect how we um, how the cells produce neurotransmitters. So this is directly related to um, our neurons. Um, our genetic makeup directly affects our neurons, our neurotransmitter systems. But mostly what we look at is sort of a higher level systems neuroscience explanation um, using fMRI and using TMS we can, we can observe and manipulate the brain and then look at how this correlates with behavior or how behavior changes after we manipulate the brain. So this is basically the levels of explanation we are mostly interested in. Um, and obviously the integrated neural firing of the neurons, uh, the way they interact within the brain influences our behavior, which is typically the domain of psychology. So individual behavior, um, which is reflected by psychology and, and uh, behavioral economics. The domain of psychiatry also looks at this relationship between brain and behavior. Again, this is one of the core disciplines um, or, or the core questions that cognitive neuroscience asks. What is this relationship between what happens in the brain and the behaviors we exhibit? and commonly asked in, in functional magnetic resonance imaging as well. And then finally, we have the domain of economics and social psychology, which is more broadly how groups make decisions, which are basically composed of multiple individual brains. And obviously, all of these different levels of explanations or levels of behavior that we can look at are interrelated, right? So the way groups behave, uh, 
the way groups reproduce and the way they um, allow migration, for instance, influences our genetic makeup, uh, which again influences the, the makeup of our cells, including our neurons. And then we back into this circle here. Um, also, the way how groups raise their children and the types of norms and cultures that are present within certain um, uh, well, groups, cultures, societies, also influences the makeup of our brain via um, the experiences that um, maturing brains uh, receive, basically, leading to differential makeups across culture. And that is the domain of cultural neuroscience, for instance, looking at how, how nurture influences, well, but also genetics, uh, influence the makeup of our brain and what the differences are across cultures in, in let's say, tasks like um, mathematics or simple computations, are there differences across, let's say, Asian versus Western cultures, um, etc. But I'm digressing here. So we have different levels of explanation and we can look at, at all of these different levels uh, using um, different parts of, of, of scientific research. But we are mostly interested in the orange fields, namely the relationship between the brain and the behavior. That's what we'll talk about mostly in this course. This is shown here again. We have we have behavior by individuals and by groups, and we have biological components that we believe influence behavior, but obviously the influence between these two different levels of explanation is bidirectional. Now coming back to the to the figure from the beginning, where I told you that this is already relating to different levels of explanation. Um, we can see this here again, where for the variable of interest, namely, how do we make economic decisions, different disciplines have developed different, different levels of explanations, different variables that they're looking at. What economists call utility, for instance, uh, psychologists call decision value, and neuroscientists or neuroeconomics, uh, neuroeconomists uh, call neural activity in ventral medial prefrontal cortex or ventral striatum. So where different different disciplines have traditionally been interested in different sort of levels of explanations, but of the same types of, of behaviors. And this is something that, that we're integrating now in neuroeconomics. It leads to some difficulties in communicating across disciplines, but that is quite easily solved. Um, and and uh, with, with some study. It requires some effort, but it, it is easily solved. So let's look at some theoretical constructs that, that are common across disciplines. Economics studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means, means with which have alternative uh, use. So this is one definition of the, the interest of economics. Uh, e economists have been very good at developing standard formal theories. So mathematical formulations of how behavior should be um, that provide simple models such as utility maximization, for instance, uh, with which you can actually predict choices. So you have a mathematical model in economi uh, economics that allows you to predict how people make decisions in the optimal circumstance. Now, one problem here is obviously that humans aren't optimal. Maybe not. In, uh, maybe they are in a sense that on average their decisions lead to relatively good um, outcomes, but there are many biases that, that behavioral economics, and you, you know this from the behavioral econ class, have uh, identified. Actually, if you look at Wikipedia, there are over 200 50, I believe, cognitive biases listed there, and many of those are decision biases um, that, that influence how we perceive things in a distorted fashion and how we make decisions distortedly, in a sense. So these models rest on assumptions, and these assumptions are not always uh, met. And obviously, we all know the homo economicus assumption, which we'll talk about later. Uh, again, these assumptions do not hold in real life, so the models have only limited applicability, but on average, they seem to predict human behavior relatively well. Psychology, on the other hand, studies mental states. So the question here is, in psychology, we try to understand why we do certain things, what motivates behavior in different contexts. 
um, what are the goals and desires of people that lead to certain decisions? So it's a little bit of a different question that psychologists are asking. Um, and one of the goals also in psychology and in, in uh, w uh, welfare economics, for instance, is to improve human, uh, the human condition in a way, to find interventions that allow us to improve people's outcomes. So let's say um, some people are doing badly on some, on some task and this is a percentage of people that is quite large. Then can we find interventions that improve their well-being, that improve their decisions? in a certain way. So can we train things like emotion regulation um, or can we relieve symptoms uh, of people that suffer from depression? Those kinds of things uh, are, are what psychologists are interested in. And psychologists also develop theories, but these theories look a little bit different uh, than economic theories. They're not as um, mathematical, although this is a trend that's been changing recently uh, with computational neuroscience and computational psychiatry. But uh, these theories basically offer explanations for behavior. So they're not so much uh, in the business of predicting behavior, predicting decisions, but in explaining uh, behavior. So why do these kinds of behaviors come about and what are the neural bases of these behaviors? And then finally, we have neuroscience, and neuroscience is really interested in studying the mechanisms or the mechanics of the brain. So how do neurons interact? Um, how do different brain regions interact with each other during the process of decisions? And how does this lead pot potentially to different biases? This is one of the, the early approaches in, in neuroeconomics. Can we explain decision biases based on the mechanisms of the brain? under different circumstances, let's say, in a positively framed context versus a negatively framed context, uh, are there different brain regions, brain areas in the valuation system that react differently um, to these contexts? So the main goal in neuroscience is to understand neural computations that lead to behavior. And in neuroeconomics, again, we try to combine all of these three approaches, uh, which it has been a very fruitful uh, approach recently, and we'll discuss uh, basically the outcomes of this of this approach in the early days, but also with many recent studies that we'll, that we'll talk about. So let's briefly go into methods from neuroscience. So we have actually multiple methods that we combine in neuroeconomics. Um, we have, for instance, structural and functional MRI, with structural fMRI giving us an idea of the anatomical makeup of the brain and differences of the anatomical makeup of the brain across different populations, across different people. So we can look at individual differences, which is a very interesting approach. And um, one interesting development here is the availability of larger and larger, well, we might call it brain banks, but data sets, uh, just like in economics, we have uh, data sets of 10, 20, uh, or 100,000 participants, like the socioeconomic panel in Germany. We now have the UK Brain Bank, which also has at least tens of thousands of brains available and some behavioral measures that we can correlate this with. So you can look at, um, and we'll discuss this later in, in more detail, you can look at how different structures in the brain correlate with different behaviors. So if you have more neurons in one structure, let's say, uh, or if, you're, if one of the structures is better trained, in a sense, um, than others, then how does this relate to economic behavior? We also have eye tracking, which is a very, uh, which, which has been entering the, the field of behavioral economics quite recently. So we can observe where people pay attention. Also in marketing, this is commonly used. And in fact, you can now do this. Um, you can track eye movements via your camera on the screen, uh, on, your, on your laptop. Um, and we have manipulation methods uh, where we manipulate the brain by applying a magnetic pulse, a relatively strong magne magnetic pulse over the cortex, which leads to basically a, a rel relatively short duration, 30 minutes to one hour um, lesion of this region. Or, well, it's, it's, it's not a, a lesion, but basically this region will be exhausted, the neurons in this region, and they will not um, contribute to the types of behaviors that we that we make for a short period of time. So it's a way to uh, 
to turn off a specific part of the brain for a relatively short period of time. But by far the most commonly used um, method is functional MRI because it's cheap, it's relatively easy to apply. It's not cheap, but it's relatively cheap. Um, and it allows you to observe a direct neural correlate um, of behavior within the brain. And it's also not intrusive. So let's have a look at this. So we have um, the picture here on the left is showing the seven Tesla Philips Achiever scanner. So seven Tesla is a relatively high mag magnetic field strength uh, that improves some of the, of the image quality. Uh, and this is hosted at the Spinoza Center here at the UVA. We also have a 3T scanner in, in basically the building next door to the economics building. And uh, what fMRI does, functional magnetic resonance imaging, it's basically the functional part that we're interested in. It, it uh, tracks the blood flow within the brain and changes in the blood flow. What we're most important to in one task, uh, what we're most interested in, uh, in one task condition versus the other task condition. So we're looking at changes in oxygen levels because oxygen levels basically reflect the energy consumption of a certain area of neurons, of a certain cluster of neurons. If there's more oxygen consumption in a certain region, then what happens is the brain overcompensates and sends more oxygen than needed to this area in the brain. Uh, and this is something we can then visualize via statistics um, in, the, in these types of uh, brain images or statistical maps that, that we get within the brain. Just as a brief mention on the um, basis of the signal that we're getting from functional magnetic resonance imaging, this is showing the bolt response um, or a typical canonical bolt response, also called the hemodynamic response function. This is an integral part of all the software packages that we use to analyze functional magnetic resonance images. And what you can see is here that, um, let's say you have a, dis a stimulus onset in your experimental design. So that could be, in our case, mostly this is a decision. And we know exactly the time point at which a decision occurs in a given task that we as experimenters design. Um, then what we commonly see is that there's a rise to to some peak after some time, it takes about four to eight seconds, but mostly it's within the range of five to six seconds that we observe this peak, but this varies from subject to subject and from task to task and brain region to brain region. And then it takes about 12 seconds for this, for this uh, neural response to go back to its peak. So whenever you have a, a stimulus in your, um, in your experiment, uh, you observe this kind of response, but only in regions that also encode this type of stimulus. Let's say faces versus houses. Those are encoded mostly or prominently in different parts of the brain. So when you have a task face versus house, you will find some regions, the fusiform gyres, for instance, to show this response uh, during faces, but not during houses. And then you can, you can show this in statistical maps such as this one. But... Another thing that's important here is you see that this response is relatively sloppy, so it takes some time for this for this peak to to arise um, and go back to zero, which means that we have to take for this relatively slow response, we have to take this into account in our experiments. Um, this means that we have temporal constraints in our experimental designs, uh, and we also have a very noisy signal, uh, which we cannot distinguish from task relative to no task uh, just by the by 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 uh, eye by just looking at it, right? So you can see this here. Um, this is already a sort of optimized neural response to a task relative to to a uh, no task, and you can see that these correlations here. Um, well, you couldn't tell when a task is on versus when a task is off, right? Uh, so, so you can see that the signal is noisy and that's something also that we have to take into account in our experimental designs um, when we use these kinds of methods jointly with methods from behavioral economics. Now we combine this with methods from psychology, which have looked at this extensively and have also uh, always taken into, not always, but commonly taken into account these types of timing issues. So we can, for instance, look at what is the role of emotion induction on 
economic decisions and how does this correlate in the brain. We can also use multiple um, measures of autonomic nervous system activity, which is called psychophysiology. So we have skin conductance recordings, which are basically two electrodes that we attach to the, to the fingers and they record how much you're sweating at a certain amount. We can record heart rate, uh, we can record pupil dilation, and all of these reflect how active your autonomic nervous system is, how aroused you are during a certain, um, during a certain period. We can also look at personality, which is an important aspect uh, when it comes to individual differences. So do extroverted people make different decisions in certain situations? Or do people that are uh, antisocial make different decisions when it comes to, uh, let's say, social decisions in the trust game? Those are all questions we can ask by combining methods from psychology and economics. And here's a, a task, um, an attentional queuing task uh, that also has entered recently the, the domain of behavioral economics to look at exogenous manipulations, like down here, of attention and how this influences economic decisions. We'll discuss a model in one of the um, future lectures that, that takes attention into account. Um, finally, we combine methods from neuroscience with methods from psychology and behavioral economics. And here are some obvious, obvious uh, methods from behavioral uh, economics, a trust game, uh, illustration on the left here, and a lottery decision-making task that can assess loss aversion and risk-taking uh, from one of our papers shown here on the right. So we have uh, lotteries with different gain amounts and loss amounts that we can show to subjects. And this is quite easily, those, both of these tasks are quite easily translated um, into the scanner. So let me stop this part of the lecture here. And in the following lecture, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the goal of neuroeconomics and the historical origins of neuroeconomics. So I see you soon.